Hello, I'm Don Moores, and welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. There have been many predictions regarding the minority vote and what's going to have a big effect on the outcome of November 8th's presidential election. Mariana Cordier, a local attorney and frequent guest on this show, is here to tell us what she thinks. The League of Maryland, League of Women Voters of Maryland, studying the ways in which districts for the General Assembly and the Maryland Legislature and the Maryland Legislature should be divided up. Elaine Apter from the League is here to explain what they will be studying in the coming months. Our new superintendent of schools, I'm not sure when he's no longer the new superintendent of schools, and he just becomes the superintendent of schools, fast approaching his very first budget season, which includes the capital and operating budgets discussion with the Board of Education. Jane DeWinter who makes our schools more understandable on this show, at least that's what it says here, is here to comment. <laughs> your will and your overall estate plan, very important, particularly if you have, like the majority of Americans, avoided thinking about this very, very important issue. Well, if you haven't acted, it's time to act. Martha Hildago Rubio, a local attorney in Montgomery County, is here to tell us all about why we should be thinking about this now. Mariana. Hello. Ms. Cordier, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me back. So what's with this minority voters, immigrant voters, all of these folks? Well, Isn't it, don't, you know, every two years, four years, we have an election and most people come out and vote, hopefully, and any issues in the immigrant community? Well, I think the immigrant community is very aware um, of the immigration issues, particularly in this election season, it's been raised uh, and brought to the forefront. So um, the Latino voters, for instance, are very interested, but they're not the only community interested um, in what is the plan or what is going to happen in the future and which of the candidates would really represent the best interest for them. 2016 presidential election, mm -hmm. the campaign, it seems like it's gone on forever. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and we're almost to an end. Yes. You've been around, you're, mm -hmm. you're still very, very young, but you've seen a few campaigns, elections. Absolutely. How, how is this year and the outreach to the Latino community in particular different from what maybe we saw in 2012 or 2008? Well, I think that there are states that are up for grabs that weren't before. And the minority vote is a really important one because it's not um, a typical vote. I mean, a lot of minorities, the Catholic portion of the population it may be conservative, but they're also very aware of their jobs, of, mm -hmm. of the economy, making an income to support their families. So it's, it's a, it's a toss-up as to which one of the issues will be the one that really decides on which candidate they feel will be able to get them forward. And that will make a huge difference for the election because it could really make the difference between whether it's which, Trump or Hillary. Which issue is yeah. most and, important? And, and, uh, along with that, with what you said, does it bother minority people sometimes to be lumped together mm -hmm. like the African-American community or the Well, Latino sure, because the, the African-American community's issues are a little bit different from the Latino, although there are many shared and common issues. But, you know, when you have become a United States citizen and you're going to be voting for the first time, and, it's a huge impact for you when you've been raised here and you've always had that vote and you'll exercise it or you don't or you feel like your vote matters or not. Mm -hmm. Those those are the slight differences on how people may react to it. There's some Latinos who may feel and have expressed that they feel my vote really doesn't count. Like it won't really be impactful. And so, you know, there's been a lot of outreach, particularly to the Latino communities, um, because also there's the mm -hmm. language that yeah. we have to conquer and right well speaking to that point I mean I remember hearing from somebody who was from Peru, from Peru who said I never knew that I was Latino until I moved <coughs> to the United States right. because that's not what you call yourself but I did want to ask like so in terms of numbers and like numbers of voters how you know how is the, the cohort of Latino voters going to differ from before? Is it a much larger percentage or I know there's been outreach but how effective? Well it, and it's been growing. Um, you know the population has been growing. Um, the folks that have been naturalized is always you know that number is always growing. Um, so and, and, and I think the biggest impacts you will see are not necessarily in this elections but 
the children of these people that have been here in the last 10 years, so it'll take about another 10 for them, you know, eventually the 10 year olds to be, you know, Every voting. election cycle, we're gonna see more You're and more. You're gonna see sure. an, uh, an increase and a significant increase. And I also think that, you know, like you said, it's a very good point, Latinos from abroad who've come here, they don't see themselves as Latinos. They'll see themselves like, I'm an Argentine, Martha's a Colombian, you know, someone's Mexican, El Salvadorian. Right. And so it's really about what is important for that community because they are kind of sticking together. But in the overall... I'm, I'm a Latino, naturalized citizen, so I will definitely be voting uh, as my family members. But I think the concern that I have, and I've always had, is the complacency within our community because, as you said, they think their vote's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. And whether you're Mexican of Mexican descent or you're from South America, <coughs> some of the candidates obviously uh, attract other groups. But uh, what do you think the the uh, outreach is doing for well, complacency. Well, I think the most important thing about the outreach is to educate them as to where you can vote because the, sometimes they're not paying attention as to where they can go and where they have to go if it's, for instance, on election day as opposed to early voting. Early voting has had an impact, a significant impact in, I think, the minority community, our community, because a lot of them have used that advantage because of their working. It, because you can do it at your workplace it's, instead of where you live. Now, exactly. let me ask you, you've got 30 seconds left. Okay. I want you to look in that camera right there. I want you to make your best pitch to those folks who might be complacent in whatever language you want to use to get out and vote. Why should they get out and vote? You need to get out and vote because your vote counts. It's the difference between knowing what you're going to do for work, how you're going to be paid, what days you have off and what days you don't have off with regard to family leave. It has to do whether or not your family can immigrate to the United States legally. On Espanol in 10 seconds. Por favor, voten porque cuenta tu voto. Sin tu voto, Eh, puede tener un impacto muy desastroso en este país. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're that was so good. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I'm going to put you out there in PSAs. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming from this election mm -hmm. to to what the League of Women Voters has done is to is to work so hard. And I know, and, and we're not going to get into discussions of one of the candidates casting aspersions on the efficacy of the whole process, because I know that's near and dear to the League of Women Voters, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about going from the federal election now to the state house, general assembly. As I understand, I mean, we do that. You know, we've got, we have multi-district or multi-seat districts for the general assembly, the house of delegates, and then one senator. You guys are looking to see, would we be better off as a state if we had single delegate districts? Right. instead of what we have now, which are three, grouped as three. Right, and um, it was interesting because when I moved to Maryland and I got that state ballot and I could vote for three uh, Maryland delegates, I thought, yeah, this is kind of crazy. We're only one of 10 states that still has the multi-member. And the larger, in Montgomery County, the larger population areas are the ones that still have the multi-member and that means you have a large district and that whole district votes for three delegates. So you've got, so you've got, you know, there are those who are on both sides of this. I mean, look at it. One is it's uh, against parochialism. If I got three, I'm not parochial. Others look at it as saying, well, if we have three, then nobody is responsible. They can all look at one another and then they can also say, well, this person is so great and, and and so we're that's I mean, true and and with the three um if you somebody is doesn't agree with you on an issue or doesn't solve a problem you've got two more that say on the other hand in a smaller area that person is probably uh much more receptive to you because your vote is going to count well, a how lot does more. that work constituent wise you know when we deal with the federal representatives you know you know who is in your district and you go and you say and they ask you are you in my district? Right. That seems kind of odd right. that you well, have. And if they do, point. you have three people that will say yes. And the interesting mm -hmm. part, especially in the east and west, the 14th and 15th districts, the 15th goes from Potomac all the way through Clarksburg and mm -hmm. Damascus and the Ag Reserve. So those people are going to have very, very different issues and concerns. If you broke them up, and uh, possibly you could have that southern area that's more populated, maybe a growing area, and then the ag reserve and that area. But that goes to redistricting, which is a whole other mm -hmm. part right. of well, it. Well, I was going to ask, are we, is every single county in the state have 
the same the same three delegates per district, or is there variation? Oh, no, we have lots of variation. Mm -hmm. We have some that are the single district. There are three different districts. You also have two and one, where one part of the district will have two representatives, and one will have a single representative. Support, so it's we're it's all mixed up. Historically, in Montgomery County, we used to have 14A and 14B. And so we had a single district in Montgomery County with two in Howard County. Our growth then brought us to eight full districts. So is it based on population? It's all yes. based on population. It's all, and it's redistricting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. you can imagine uh -oh, what's going word. to come <laughs> out if you're going to redistrict. Who has the power to make the changes? So if Montgomery County wanted to change this, they can do it, it on would their be, own? Or it would be the state. And the reason we're studying it is every, uh, two, every year, either the House or the Senate in the state comes up with a bill to bring us to the single district. Martha? That's exactly what I was going to ask you because you mentioned that Maryland is one of the only 10 states yes. that has a system. Um, what, how are we moving towards that? And, and that, that's one of the things. And the question is, is it good or bad? And one of the things we're looking at is minority representation, women representation. And interestingly enough, in the multi-member districts, Sometimes you get better women, especially women representation, because if you vote for three and you don't Well, love I can check off woman, one woman, I can one check guy. Off, right, <laughs> on my head. You got it. Woman. And same thing with minority. <laughs> on the other hand, mm -hmm. you're, you could get redistricting, and that happens a lot, and that is where you'll take a min minority and redistrict them so they're in a district and they will have one representation. And there's pros and cons to that too, because then they don't have representation. Well, because the it, you know, I'm they're always worried about you know the drawing the lines conveniently, depending who's doing the drawing, right? You could it, even break up a minority community. I think that it yeah. was very enlightening to me when the last time we had the Maryland districts, which was in I guess 2010, yes. to understand that every single delegate and seconds. senator knows exactly where all of their mm -hmm. the neighborhoods yeah. where their opponents Absolutely. live. Right, Absolutely. right. And that plays a big role. It'd be mm -hmm. interesting to see, we've got about just a few seconds, it'd be interesting, uh, uh, Baltimore, a big thing, because Baltimore benefits greatly from these multi-districts as well as incumbents. So it's going to be very right. interesting yeah, to see what you guys come back yeah. with. So um, we will have, we're going to have a consensus and we should have a report by the spring as to if we come out with an actual position. Can't wait to hear all yeah. about it. Thank you so much, Elaine. Sure. We'll be right back after these commercials. Public service announcement. And we're back. Jane DeWinter, it seems very interesting. This time, we've gone through discussions with you through the years at this juncture in each of these superintendents, whether it's the interim, it's the new superintendent, mm -hmm. other superintendents. So report card on Superintendent Smith. What's going on here? Okay, well, the first thing I'm gonna answer your question, you said, when will he stop being the new superintendent? Yes. I think it's usually after he hits the one year mark. Okay, mm -hmm. after the one year mark. Yeah. Or, or, okay, he's been bloodied through the budgetary. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he wants, he's gone through the whole thing, exactly. Okay. And, when do, so. and when do people start talking behind his back, innuendo, saying, my God, how, what's, how long do we have to suffer through the Superintendent? Well, this is Montgomery County. It probably started before he arrived. Okay. So, right. you know, okay. um, but anyway, he did just release the capital budget, but um, we'll say the capital budget actually is on a two-year cycle, mm -hmm. so this is an off year. So right. there were some minor changes, okay. some ex uh, proposing some sort of placeholder projects, really, I think, to forestall the, the moratorium for growth. Okay. And um, also suggested a couple boundary changes. So I don't think that that in itself, itself makes a real litmus test. Well, the boundary changes, certainly with those communities affected, I think, you know, is it Whitman District? BCC District, yeah. no, Einstein, no. I mean, where are we here? No, it is a Highland Elementary School. Uh, is got one very small segment that goes to Sligo Middle okay. School. And yeah, it's Elementary that's, that's school, it's not little. doing the big picture with the high schools. No, Set not yet. The, no, the, it's, the, it's, right, it's, Hatfields and McCoys. Yeah. And, and then, well, then there's a boundary study because it's for a new, a new school that's right. going to open. Okay. Um, but the 
the operating budget, which will be a lot more telling. That's getting released in early December. And that's so billions and billions and billions of yes, dollars, Yes, $2.7 billion, dollars. Well, yeah. The governor has just come out and cut some things. Will any of that affect? Do we You're know asking me something that I don't <laughs> know. Yeah, yeah. Um, because he's yeah. proposed quite a few cuts. Well, let, let's go back to the is. twins. What the twins, the the the, the Hogan Francho twins, uh, came out with with the school changes. Tweedledum oh. and Tweedledumer. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, <laughs> what the 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 school year mm -hmm. it, it certainly plays the yeah, backdrop. Yeah, and that here. actually is because the county uh, the the school board <laughs> just put together their legislative platform for you know for the upcoming session, and of course opposing you know the 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 move to have school starts dictated and the school calendar dictated by the governor was one of by the things. By Ocean City uh, exactly. Resorts, uh, yeah. hotels. Yeah, and it also Boardwalk. surprised me a big port, a lot, a lot of their points were regarding school construction mm -hmm. and, you know, more funding for construction. And then, of course, there's also, you know, the funding formulas defending, you know, the fact that, you know, we will get extra money for, you know, our ESOL population, right. et cetera. So that's part of. Um, I imagine that that's a that quite impactful to the, all of the systems because to have you know teaching a second language, mm -hmm. you know, to you know children who don't speak English and having them integrate into the schools is, is not easy. It's, it's right. I mean, it does. It, it is something that impacts you know more than Montgomery County, but Montgomery County is is one of the places where yeah. it is the most the, mo the most kids. Right. Sure. You know, I mean, we know that. I mean, some counties they might feel like oh they're all of a sudden getting you know getting a lot more immigrants, but we're talking about okay going from 15 to 30. Right. You know. Well, even the overcrowding. There's a lot of overcrowding in the Silver Spring that downtown Silver Spring area, but there's a lot of overcrowding in Clarksburg, which is a booming right. uh, new right. area of right. development. Right, and they are, and that's one of the things where they now boundary studies because they are new actually and it's a new high school. Right. They just got a new middle school. Well, and they right. just yeah, and they they've had a new elementary school, so they're looking at another elementary school there. Um, in the Bethesda area too, they're, when they're with talking the about yeah. with, the infill, with the infill, right? Sure. And schools have been mentioned. It's interesting. I mean, coming back with these old. I wouldn't say abandoned, but have been the the, the uh, tenants have transferred from the students and the teachers to nonprofit organizations in some of these school buildings. Mm -hmm. Are we going to go back? Are we going to come back into some of these schools or kick out the the, the folks who are in there now uh, um, in the Bethesda Chevy Chase mm -hmm. area? Or yeah, I mean there are some of the schools that are under consideration. I mean they're you know they're closed schools. They're usually largely mm -hmm. repurposed. Some the school board owns some of them, but some of them. Um, have been surplus to the county okay. so that the school board is not if it's surplus to the county it's a county lease it's whatever and even so there you know sometimes it depends on what kind of political friends seconds. the 30 tenants seconds left. have Three seconds left. Um, I Your just wanted plus. to draw a, a, a differentiation um, every time I saw Josh Starr at an event with students he would be sitting down staring at his phone and tweeting. Okay. Saw Jack Smith at an event. He brought his own family, his grandson, totally okay. engaged. Okay. I think that's a great sign. The engaged superintendent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's, that's okay. fantastic. Thank you. That's a great way to end. So now we go from an engaged superintendent of looking <laughs> with their, our kids and all that stuff now to something that we associate more with end of life. Uh, the will, though certainly the kids are a key part of this. Martha, welcome. This is your first time on the show, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to have you. So tell us a little bit about what a will is and, and why you are why you think it's so important. Well, there are many families that I know and many families that are out there that don't have any type of planning for their kids. And what does that mean? Two parents are driving in a car, they get into an auto accident, they both die, unfortunately. So what's going to happen to their kids? What's going to happen to their house? Who's going to take care of the finances? And those are things that a will uh, that you have to either write down or uh, type it or handwrite it uh, tells whoever's going to get your will, your personal representative, what's going to happen with your kids, who's going to take care of so them. So it's you while you're of sound mind and body. I, I, in that, you know, we hear about that. You're making decisions. You hope it doesn't happen. It's like insurance. Sure. Is is what's is is how your property, how your kids, your wishes while you're living in case in case. You, of your demise. It's not something you want to think about, but somebody. But, you have to, but you? if you have young kids, 
uh, there's a lot of years left. Uh, there's a lot of schooling, education. There's a lot of legal decisions that have to be made, and that all can be set out in a will. The finances also, who's going to take care of providing for them? Right. If there's going to be a guardian of the person, which means that means take care of the children, and there's going to be a guardian of the property. If you love your kids, I mean, so often we see this this scurrying about. I mean, don't we see fights between family members? Well, or that's different the thing. That's what we see, and that's why we always cringe because we're always saying. Well, is there a will? Did you at least? And, and sometimes right. people do the wills, but they don't tell. They ask the person, will you be the guardian? Will you be this? Right. But they don't talk to anybody else. And right. it's a conversation that you really have to have because in, in the, in it the, reduces the conflict. And in, for example, in custody cases, let's say one parent is awarded residential custody of the mm -hmm. children and legal custody of the children. That parent dies. Uh, it's not automatically that the parent that doesn't have custody mm. that gets the children. A, a, uh, grandparent, another relative that's been caring for them can step in and say, I know I want custody of the children. And if there's nothing in the will, yeah. then the court's yeah, going to have to determine. We've seen cases right. where the, the father or the mother has been out of the picture for years. The kids barely know them. Right. And all of a sudden, they're the one that, because they're the biological parent who wants to take over. And sometimes it's also that they want to be able to control their finances. And right. mm -hmm. So it, it's, it can be very heartbreaking and, and torturous process if you mm -hmm. don't have your documents in place. So what you're saying in many ways is the courts, if you don't speak, right. it's got to go to the courts, and the courts are going to make decisions. And if you've got kids involved, then it's a tug of yeah. war, and kids yeah. end up becoming but the losers. But the interesting thing to me is we always think of wills <coughs> for older people because right. maybe they have the financial uh, assets that would warrant right. a will. But the way you're talking, it's more, almost more important for the younger, especially newly married and young children, to have a will. And it's a conversation you have to have for the person, uh, the parent that's chosen, you know, a relative to take care of the children, that relative may not want that responsibility. So then you have to think of the alternative, what's going to happen. So you can, you can put that in the will, the sister you can't stand, you're taking my kids, you get the ultimate revenge on that. Yes. No, right. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, I mean, it seems to me that it might be that a lot of people avoid this because they can't, they either don't, can't decide or don't want to offend anybody, or maybe they're having trouble thinking of somebody who would take care of their kids. That's true, but if they don't have anybody named as a guardian of the of the children, then it's going to go before the court. The Word of the state. Yes. Yeah, and the other thing that, you, that goes hand in hand with this are medical directives. You need to tell What's people, you know, this is where you is put a paper down that says how far to go to resuscitate you to keep you alive or not. And so, and, and to talk to your family about that because, you know, it's a really bad shock when your family wants you to go all the way as far as they can to treat you and you've put down no doubt, you know. And so you it, need to talk to your family about that. Uh, not only that, but for example, in, in talking about children, maybe even adult children, a parent may not want to be cremated, a parent may not want to be buried Lay in a certain there. place. That can be in the will, right. but that's a conversation you have to have with your family because you don't have access to the will the moment uh -huh. you die. It may yeah. be stored away, somebody may be holding it. Right. So it's really important to even in the will to set out uh, the parameters of, of and we're funeral talking expenses. About different things than, than like you know the favorite jewelry or f painting or yeah. pictures because right. as I understand it, if you put those in a will, if you change your mind or if you sell something or whatever, that you've got to change the whole will over again. And, and so a lot of times you just want to write down, I mean, you're talking about making sure that your yeah, right, family yeah. members know that, that you're going to get this ring. Very daughter, specific instructions this. as yeah. to uh, how your property is going to be divided, what's going to happen to even to you when you pass. Right. Uh, but the other decisions that you were talking about as far as custody and things like that, they're tough decisions. Do you actually work with? We have 30 seconds left. Or do left. you have somebody, a, a group that works with people that are having trouble discussing this? 15 seconds. Um, I mean, I think you talk to an attorney or, or somebody that's uh, in that field. Or send uh, them out to a counselor. To send them out yeah. to a counselor to make that decision because that's not an easy decision. You, your yeah. brother who lives yeah. in New Jersey may be the greatest person in the world, but what's going to happen? Are you going to bring your children what? to a different state? That's the final word. Right. Something we don't like to talk about at the end yeah. of our lives, but it's going to happen to all of us, yes. unfortunately. And what's fortunate, though, is that we've been together. And thank you all for joining me. And thank all of you in the viewing audience for joining us for this week's edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moores inviting you to join us next week at this very same time.